Negative phase sequence protection. That is the topic of this next video, and we're going to cover off both the NPS element by itself and also the broken conductor I2 on I1 configuration. If you want to know the theory behind how these particular features work, if that's something that's new to you, then there is a webinar that we have created, so you can get in contact with us and we'll be able to share that one with you, just to explain what the background is and the application of those features. There is a lot of value in implementing this stuff, and particularly the I2 on I1 configuration, that tends to be quite simple, and it works fairly well across most networks. So if it's not something that you're using right now, and you want to have the ability to detect broken conductors, something that will not be picked up by overcurrent or earth fault, then I strongly encourage you to check that out and consider rolling it out within your network. All right, but for those of you that have watched our overcurrent video or our earth fault video, the configuration for negative phase sequence is pretty much the exact same thing. You have a reclose map that determines what you're going to do tripping on the first, second, third, and fourth trip, up to as many as what you'd like to have. And then your ability to either polarize that by making it a directional element or just to act on magnitude by itself, which is the default configuration. I'm just going to save that one there. If we wanted to configure these individual ones, we can drill into them by clicking on them, and it again brings up the curve map. So it's something that's very simple for us to be able to configure. And usually, you will have these protection settings on hand as to what you need to configure. So you might have a specific curve that you need to add, a pickup level of whatever that configuration is for your feeder, and then you can go ahead and punch in those numbers. Click OK, and it is committed to the uh, configuration file. For the I2 on I1 configuration, so this one, you don't have access to a reclose on that. Generally, if you have a broken conductor, that is not something that you want to try and mitigate with reclosing operations. So therefore, you either have the ability to alarm, which is something that I recommend if people haven't used this before and they want to get an understanding for what the network dynamics are, or if you've calculated that and you're very sure that you want to automatically lock out when you detect an I2 on I1 condition, then you can configure that to lock out. So it works basically the same as what all the other ones do. And actually, this idea of having alarm, disable, lockout is very similar to the frequency and voltage elements that we'll consider in a later video. Your pickup value here is a percentage, so 20% by default, which covers most of the cases, and I will say is worth having a look at with an alarm to ensure you don't get spurious tripping to sort of get a feel for where your level needs to be on your network in a practical sense. Then we also have the minimum I2. So one of the limitations with I2 on I1 is that if you have very low currents, then it doesn't take an awful lot to get to that 20% threshold. But once you cross, say, 15 amps of I2, that implies that you can have a substantial load there. So you mitigate the risk of spurious trip, and you can configure your tripping time down below. So with those elements configured there, you are now ready to go to detect broken conductors. And generally, if you're not choosing to lock out on that configuration and you have SCADA available, you would route that back to your SCADA um, master station. So you can use that to tell your operators that there's a broken cable on that line, and it certainly needs some investigation. 